Okay, well, this is a part two of a five-part series looking at supercell formation and tornado genesis uh, of two different types, one with uh, supercell mesocyclones and then the other one non-mesocyclonic tornado genesis, and that's what I'm going to focus on in this part. Okay, so our objectives with this lesson would be to identify the main ingredients associated with tornado genesis, which interestingly don't really vary. It's just the source for stretching and vertical vorticity and then look at the key physical features uh, that are related to non-mesocyclone tornado development. Okay, so tornado genesis, of course I'm cheating here, we show a picture of actually a supercell tornado, this is the start of the El Reno tornado. Point is, whether this is, it's a tornado like this, or one that looks like this, much more typical so-called land spout look, the basics of tornado genesis are the same, it's just a matter of how you get the ingredients arranged. We need near surface vorticity and simply put a swirly or spin. You need something near at the ground where there's spin, and you need something to stretch that. Now, this is the scary part if you are an operational meteorologist or even if you storm chase or anything else. How many different types of surface-based thunderstorms cannot possibly have some sort of low-level spin and updraft stretching? Good luck if you think there's any of them. And anyone who watches convection along the Gulf Coast or say the Florida sea breezes even in the summer and you wonder why was there a random tornado or two today, eventually you co-locate some sort of swirly with an updraft. And you see this all the time down by the Florida Keys or in Northeast Colorado where there's something in the background, confluence lines with the islands based on the background flow or terrain driven circulations that provide the circulation. And, um, Anytime you get updrafts on top of these swirlies, you can get these uh, non-mesocyclone tornadoes. Now supercells, they just provide the vorticity a different way and it's a more repeatable process and it's more internal to the storm. And we'll talk about that more in part three. Okay, non-mesocyclone tornadoes, here's just an example. You know, you don't have to memorize every little detail of the uh, diagram. The point here is that typically we're looking for some sort of cyclonic shear boundary in the low levels and we're talking about Vertical vorticity is already present along the boundary. So there would be a cyclonic change in the winds across the boundary at some level near the surface. You get updraft development atop the boundary. It concentrates the vorticity and the convergence that rearranges and tightens the circulation and then stretching of the deeper updraft can result in tornado genesis if we have sufficient stretching and vertical vorticity. Now sufficient is not easily defined. On what scale? We don't observe the uh, winds and vorticity on the scale we need to say for sure that there's enough spin and enough stretching to amplify the tornado proportions. But we can say, at least conceptually, cyclonic shear boundaries with deep developing updrafts are a likely location for non-supercell or non-mesocyclonic tornado genesis. So again, we're just looking for the swirlies and we're looking for something to get an updraft going atop the swirly, which the boundary is a natural convergence source. Now there are plenty of other ways you can see this with, uh, on the lower left, these occasionally spectacular examples, I believe that's from the Mediterranean, but with series of vortices that get amplified into water spouts along convergence bands, and then on the right, this is one from, I believe, Western Kansas, where you see something similar over land with just, uh, it's a little bit drier environment. Point is, if you, everything works right, you can get a whole series of these tornadoes, and some of these occasionally can produce significant damage if they happen to be sitting somewhere where they form. Okay, so we're going to look at a non-mesocyclone tornado example case just to show you what you would be looking for if you're trying to forecast something like this, and we're going to focus on South Central Kansas. This is a late summer case, so we're talking the end of August. Short wave trough approaching the central high plains, but the flow is primarily to the northwest, a little bit farther northwest of the area we're focusing on, which is closer to, say, Wichita, Kansas, right in the, kind of the, right in the middle of the box there. Low levels, this is 850 millibars, and these are near the time of the event, the actual upper air analyses. Flow is not particularly strong, 10, 15 knots. So this, this is not a real strongly baroclinic, strong vertical shear environment. So first guess, you would not think supercell tornadoes as a big threat. Okay, this is using SPC mesoanalysis graphics. We jump to the surface. We see, I've sketched in the blue line, that's the weak cold front, or really it's a stationary front. It's just sitting there during the afternoon. And you see that dew points in the yellows and P 
pink colors up toward Kansas City, those are in the 70s, and then it drops off to the upper 60s down in Oklahoma. And then temperatures in the mid to upper 80s, perhaps 90 degrees. So it's warm, it's moist, and that's co-located with the boundary itself. Now, the reason I say that when I said before we didn't think this would be a big supercell environment, what I've got plotted here is the zero to six kilometer bulk wind difference or the shear vector over the last six kilometers of the atmosphere. This is related to supercell formation. And again, we'll talk about this some more in part four of this series, looking at the supercell composite. This one shows that the deep layer vertical shear is all to the cool side of the boundary. It does not overlap the warm sector. It really wouldn't suggest supercell formation along the front itself. So the deep layer vertical shear is relatively weak, mostly along the front. Large buoyancy, this would be the surface base cape. You can see it exceeds 4,000 up into Kansas, relatively weak convective inhibition given that there's no color shading there. It's all less than 25 joules per kilogram, except for a little spot there near Emporia. Point is, it's strongly buoyant. Deep layer vertical shear is not particularly strong. But we do have relatively steep low-level lapse rates. If anyone remembers conditionally unstable or absolutely unstable lapse rates, uh, in this case, these would be conditionally unstable, somewhere between moist adiabatic and dry adiabatic lapse rates. So in the low levels, there's not a lot of resistance to vertical stretching. And this is also one I don't know, hopefully people look at this occasionally. This is the vertical vorticity and convergence or divergence plot, also off the SPC mesoanalysis. The shaded area is the vertical vorticity along the boundary. Again, at the scale of this analysis, which is a 40 kilometer grid spacing, it could be quite a bit higher if we had like some sort of micronet along the boundary, which we don't. But you notice that there towards south central Kansas, there's a maximum in convergence, which are the red contours, and in the color fill, which is the vertical vorticity. So we've got large buoyancy, steep low level lapse rates, vertical vorticity, and convergence all co-located. This is where hopefully the little warning lights go off and go, wait a minute, what might happen if I put developing thunderstorms in this environment? Well, guess what? We had developing thunderstorms. I assume you would figure that out or I wouldn't show you this case where nothing happened. Here's one, this is uh, just to the south of Wichita. You see, and to the upper right, there's a band of convection and off to its immediate southeast is the outflow boundary with the convection. And then that north-south line is actually the front that's been enhanced. You're looking at insects or something along the boundary. And that little intersection is about where the arrow points. This is where the outflow from the existing convection intersects the front, which had a lot of vertical vorticity along it. So what we notice is that as we go forward, there's a tendency for new reflectivity formation in the direction of the intersection because the outflow that extends to the south of the storms is moving south. So that intersection point is propagating southward with time. We get new development, aloft, the reflectivity increases, and you even see this small weak echo region, so that's a sign of locally a very strong updraft sitting right atop that boundary intersection. So in the low levels, this is just the uh, base velocity from, and the radar site is directly to the north, so if you look where the arrow is, there's weak cyclonic shear, just weak inbounds to the east and weak outbounds to the west, nothing very strong, but we go forward and you see the a stronger circulation signature in the low levels becomes apparent. And if we look aloft, initially it was just convergent there. And now we see cyclonic. And then you see an actually a quite a strong circulation that develops from the bottom up, which is typical of non-mesocyclone tornado genesis. And this is actually the tornado that was produced. And the one thing that I like to emphasize in this case is you notice it was temperatures were in the 80s, dew points were near or above 70. Non-mesocyclone tornadoes don't have to look like little dirt whirlies. That's not always what they look like. This actually produced EF2 damage, and unfortunately it sat over a farm for about 15 minutes, and eventually the damage added up. So this is one of those things, and I will be honest, this was a case where I put out a severe thunderstorm watch early in an evening shift and perhaps did not give the environment enough credit. So this was a strong tornado in a severe thunderstorm watch that I issued. There were some wind and hail reports, but it just goes to show that there are plenty of things you need to consider when you're trying to forecast this. Because if you come in with a preconceived notion of what you think the outcome is going to be and you ignore the actual environmental evidence, you, know, you can be left holding the bag. So the point is, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. It happens to the most experienced forecasters, but there are ways to sniff out these events. And this is actually a fairly repeatable pattern that you will see, especially in the central United States, 
In certain years, you may see it two or three times in the warm season. Okay, now there are limiting factors. You know, it's not just, okay, I find a few ingredients that are favorable. What are some of the limiting factors? The first and foremost would be, is it stable in the low levels? Can we, because we don't have the pressure perturbation effect that we will have with a supercell to draw the air upward. This is all gonna be based on background low-level convergence, so we need steep low-level lapse rates. So we can't have a lot of convective inhibition, we can't have stable lapse rates, and we can't have cold, stable air near the ground, or the whole thing will, it just will not work. Another problem is if there's enough flow in the atmosphere or vertical shear, kind of on the margins of supercell cases, if the storms move away from the boundary too soon, you don't have time to amplify the vorticity and up to tornado proportions. So you'll get a storm forming on the boundary, but if it moves off the boundary too quickly, you may end up with actually getting nothing. So I wish I could tell you exactly how long a storm needs to sit on the boundary, how strong the vorticity needs to be. All I can say is as long as it's sufficient. So this is one of the, you're thinking of these things, and I'll come back to this several more times. Tornado forecasting is a probabilistic exercise. It is not a yes, no, binary type decision. You're just saying, if I have more ingredients that favor a particular outcome, the probabilities of that outcome are higher, but there's no guarantees because we just don't observe everything we need to know. And it, so again, we'll just summarize here. We've got the basic points. We just need some sort of near surface vorticity source, a source for ver vortex stretching. Supercells actually internally provide both of those, and we'll talk about that in the next se of this sequence. Non-mesocyclone tornadoes just rely on an external source for updraft development and vertical vorticity. So again, if you can get these ingredients co-located, the important thing about having boundaries and large buoyancy and a multiple thunderstorm updraft development case is that you can repeat and get several non-mesocyclone tornadoes in sequence. It's almost impossible to rule out just getting a single tornado with any sort of storm interaction. But in this case, a lot of these boundary cases, as was illustrated in this Kansas one, you have preferential development down the boundary and you get successive tornado formation one after another. And you may see anywhere from three to six or seven tornadoes can occur in those cases. And again, it's just as long as you keep the convergence and the updraft and the vorticity co-located or you repeat the sequence, you can get multiple tornadoes forming in sequence.